Hello, everybody. I guess it's good morning in India. It's now afternoon in Singapore. So uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you all for signing in on a Saturday morning, where I'm sure you have lots of other uh, things to uh, occupy you. So I appreciate uh, you being here. Uh, the title of uh, my presentation is Innovating in Emerging Markets, How Successful Businesses Did It. And, you know, let me, let me kind of begin with a uh, little bit of an overview of uh, how I got into this uh, research topic. Uh, and also preface things by saying that I'm gonna speak for somewhere between 45 minutes to an hour, uh, and then we'll have a Q and A session, and then I'll uh, hand the floor back to uh, uh, my colleagues at Hero Wyatt. Um, so, you know, I read this edited book way back in 2009 uh, by two influential uh, academics at uh, the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, this is Ramamurthy and Professors Ramamurthy and Singh. And uh, in this edited volume, uh, which was about uh, international business, a couple of people uh, namely Professor Lou Wells and Professor Alan Rudman, who are well-known international business theorists, uh, kind of argued that, um, you know, companies that are based in the emerging markets can't really build successful branded businesses uh, because they, um, you know, they don't have the capabilities of doing so. They're good at, you know, manufacturing stuff. So you can contract manufacture over there, uh, but, branded businesses, um, that that's not going to happen. And uh, the reason for this is that they, they really weren't capable of creating the innovations that are the bedrock of um, building branded businesses. And this just seemed uh, a little bit um, wrong. And um, because I, you know, if you looked around back in 2009, you already had uh, a bunch of companies from countries like uh, India. You know, if you think about Tata Motors or Mahindra and Mahindra, uh, or if you think about Wipro and TCS and Infosys in the software space, they were uh, global branded businesses. Uh, likewise, you have Lenovo or uh, with um, higher, et cetera, from China. Uh, you could go to um, Brazil and say you have WEG in China, in you know, Turkey, you have a bunch of companies. And so it just didn't seem right that what the academic world was saying uh, and what I was observing in, in the real world. And so this led to a conversation with brands from all over the world. So for example, Jim Thompson from Thailand or Mavi Jeans from Turkey, uh, companies like Chigo and Hire and Midea from China in the uh, appliance space, uh, Apollo Tires in the tire space, or Titan from watches and jewelry in India, um, and on and on and on. And you can see that we, that, you know, it, the conversations carried on for a while with over 40 companies and uh, spanning several sectors and geographies. And the upshot of that was um, a book that uh, uh, I published with a couple of uh, co-authors. And um, what I'm going to speak to you today about is some of the key things that uh, came out of that book. Uh, what are key drivers of business success? Uh, I'm going to pick up five because obviously uh, a book has uh, a lot to say and I have uh, a limited time today. And so um, uh, I'm going to focus on five things. The first is that, you know, if you look at these companies, they focus on narrow segments. Uh, number two is uh, there's a lot of customer centric product innovation. Uh, number three, uh, there is frugal process innovation, and I'll get into product and process innovation in a bit. Uh, they deploy their uh, resources in a very, very focused manner. And finally, they engage in continuous innovation throughout the business model. 
So I'm going to elaborate on these uh, uh, five points in the next uh, 40 to 50 minutes, and then uh, you know uh, I'll be happy to uh, take questions. So let's take the first one, focus on narrow customer segments to fit with limited resources. So first of all, let's talk about the limited resources. So take Mahindra and Mahindra, the automotive business has revenues of roughly $6 billion uh, annually. You compare it with the companies that they comp compete with. Well, Volkswagen has revenues of $250 billion annually. Toyota has uh, revenues of $235 billion annually. So that's roughly a multiple of, of 40. And so Mahindra and Mahindra focuses on a very narrow segment of vehicle buyers. They're primarily in India. Today, of course, they're also present in Southern Europe, in Africa, in uh, uh, South America. Uh, but their biggest market by far is India. And uh, they focus on uh, not all types of vehicles, but they focus on sports utility and utility vehicle buyers. So a narrow segment or a narrow category of products, if you will. Uh, take another example, Wipro, which is the third largest uh, IT services player in India. They have revenues today of about $8 billion. Uh, IBM uh, has revenues of $75 billion, so 10 times bigger than them. Accenture, another company that they compete with globally, has revenues of um, uh, $45 billion, so somewhere between uh, five and 10 times uh, larger competitors. And so really they have to focus narrowly on customers. And Wipro would tell you that they focus on the top 1000 company CXOs. Okay, so very precise uh, definition of the customers that they, uh, that they target. So CXOs working for the top 1000 companies in the world. All right, so they're, they're narrowly focused. Why are they narrowly focused? Because they have to be very careful about the, their resource capability. Um, as uh, Wipro's then marketing head uh, mentioned to me, she said that, well, you know, our annual revenues are the size of IBM's marketing budget. So we have to be really, really careful about how we deploy uh, our resources. And so, uh, and that begins by saying, this is the customer segment that I'm going to focus on. Now, um, once you start focusing narrowly, then that gives you room for innovation. But I think the interesting point that I would like to make in, in the um, innovation is uh, that on the product side, the innovation is highly customer centric. So if you uh, talk to car companies and maybe some of you uh, may have been, uh, may have worked in car companies or are currently working in car companies, uh, my, my contacts in these companies tell me that typically um, the uh, a new car is designed with the platform in mind, i.e. the chassis and the powertrain and so on and so forth. That forms the core of the uh, uh, of a new car. And then the shell is uh, and, and the interiors come as a secondary element that is constrained by what the platform is. Now at Mahindra, they reverse the process. So it begins with what the exterior and the interior of the car should be like. And the reason for this is, is very simple, but that's what the customers experience. So how does the dashboard look? Uh, how does the seat feel? As you step into the vehicle, uh, do you have to step up very high? Or for that matter, uh, for example, uh, do you, uh, you know, once you're seated, 
uh, is the uh, seat comfortable, is the level of air conditioning correct, and so on and so forth. And so they then, once they figured out what it is that the customer wants, they then go and say, okay, now to make this uh, a reality, we need to build a chassis of the following type and so on and so forth. And so this, the Scorpio, which was launched in 2002 uh, and has been a wildly popular vehicle and continues to be a wildly popular vehicle, not only in India, but uh, around the world. So for example, uh, in 2019, I spent a few months at the University of Santiago in Chile and uh, several of the Uber rides that I took while I was visiting there, uh, I sat in a Scorpio, uh, which was a great, uh, you know, uh, great experience and a matter of pride that uh, here was an Indian company that was selling, uh, you know, on the other side of the planet, if you will, uh, the vehicles that were being made, made in India. So, uh, focus on the part that the customer really cares about and then build the rest of the car that makes a big difference um, most recently they've la launched the xuv 700 and uh, as you can see i pulled this off their website a couple of weeks ago when i was getting ready to i was getting prepared prepared for today's talk and um uh, the XUV 700 appears to be, uh, you know, the car with the fastest level of bookings to one lakh bookings in the history of uh, SUVs in India, which is a pretty impressive outcome. So, so focusing on the um, on what matters to the customer is super important in product innovation. And I'll give you other examples. So, there's a Turkish company called Ulker, and it makes chocolate biscuits. Now, this is what the typical chocolate biscuit looks like, this image that you see on the screen. It's a biscuit that is coated in chocolates. Uh, this is fine and dandy in uh, climates where the temperature remains low or in uh, developed economies. Why? Because uh, shops then are either air conditioned and most likely they have um, a refrigerated section if the temperature happens to get too hot. But if you come to a country <coughs> like India or Ulkar plays a big, has a big market in North Africa and countries like, for example, Egypt, which like India are hot in the summer, uh, these, these, these cookies are a disaster if they're not kept in a refrigerator because the chocolate melts by the time you open the packet, you've got a gooey mess and you end up with the chocolate on your hands inside, instead of inside your mouth, uh, not to mention the mess. So how does one solve that problem? One way to solve it obviously is to say that, well, we'll only sell it to retailers who have air conditioning or we'll sell it to retailers that have uh, a refrigerator, both of which would really limit their access to the kinds of customers that they're selling to. And so they came up with an interesting solution, which is that they put the chocolate inside the product. Okay, so you have a hard shelled biscuit and inside the biscuit, you have the chocolate. Now, it's a simple innovation, but you know, that's not how chocolate biscuits look like. And um, this has led to Ulker being a super successful company in, uh, Turkey and North Africa, and they have now expanded globally. And indeed, uh, many of you might have heard of Godiva Chocolates, which is a world-class chocolate brand. Uh, Ulker has now ac acquired uh, Godiva. And importantly, Ulker is transferring technology to Godiva to help them uh, up their game. So uh, again, through uh, innovation, you can, you know, you 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 can have uh, very uh, strong branded businesses, but product innovation uh, is not is just the tip of the iceberg. I think process innovation uh, is, if anything, 
maybe even more important. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So let me go back to Mahindra. Um, so Mahindra and Mahindra puts, competes by putting more engineers behind R&D projects because obviously labor, labor costs in, um, in India are relatively low. Uh, they, however, pay top dollar to a few, few key executives because these are the executives who are responsible for the program, who have the broader perspective. So they get global salaries, but then you have engineers who can do the tech stuff and they get paid less. Second thing that that's done is that you give a relatively lower proportion of the salary as um, a fixed salary and you give uh, bigger performance bonuses. Uh, essentially what this does is that it converts what would be a fixed cost to uh, a significantly more variable cost. And that's always more affordable for smaller companies. The fourth thing that they do is that, you know, we, we, when I've talked to my former classmates from my days at IIM Ahmedabad, they tend to go to the top four IIMs, so Ahmedabad, uh, Bangalore, Kolkata, and Lucknow, uh, and, and recruit from there. Uh, or they go to the IITs to recruit from there. And that to the IITs like Bombay, Kanpur, uh, Kharagpur, and uh, uh, Chennai. But there, there are lots of super, super smart and competent engineers and management graduates that are coming out of uh, lesser institutions. Um, and they went there for a variety of reasons. Maybe somebody grew up in... Uh, uh, Pune and has family reasons to not be able to leave Pune. And so they go to Pune Engineering College or Rurki Engineering College, right? Because they're from there and family constraints uh, keep them there. Or somebody um, doesn't go to an IIM because they need to get to, to work to uh, support themselves. And then they go to a part-time program in some uh, lesser known management school to get an MBA degree. But that doesn't mean that they're not capable. And so for them, getting a job with a company like Mahindra is, um, is really like the fulfillment of a dream. And they, they're more likely to be willing to work harder and accept lower salaries again. And so by strategically recruiting from less well-known institutions, that's another way that you can uh, lower your cost. And so uh, to give you an example, again, let me use the Scorpio. The Scorpio was developed from scratch in 18 months at a cost of $120 million. Uh, in Detroit, it would have taken at least three years and $1 billion. So uh, two times as much time and about uh, eight times uh, the cost. So. This, so so the, the advantage that companies like Mahindra possess is not just because the cost of labor is lower in India, but they're using different approaches to hire people to be able to, and manage people to be able to um, lower their cost and increase speed to market. Uh, but to me, the most exciting example I've ever come across is this example of BYD, which is a uh, company that makes batteries out in China. Uh, they've now expanded into uh, uh, electric cars and so on and so forth. But um, let me tell, to talk to you about uh, what they did uh, in this particular example. So. BYD, which was founded in the early 90s, started making uh, nickel cadmium batteries. And uh, soon enough, the uh, entrepreneur who'd started the business saw an opportunity in lithium ion batteries. So at that time, the world leaders in lithium ion batteries were the Japanese uh, companies like Sony, Sanyo, et cetera, were making uh, all the world's lithium ion batteries. And so uh, the founder went to Japan to see if he could buy a manufacturing line uh, for lithium ion batteries. And, um, you know, at that time, BYD had a paid up capital about, of about 
250,000 US dollars. So uh, when he went to Japan, he was horrified to learn that uh, a manufacturing line would be north of $10 million because uh, one component of the line was this thing called the clean room. And um, the clean room is necessary because you've all heard of uh, lithium ion batteries catching fire, exploding, etc. That happens when either dirt or moisture gets into the battery in the manufacturing process. So you need this sort of very herm uh, you know, pristine environment in which um, uh, the work has to happen, and 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 these rooms cost a lot of money. Uh, moreover, if you work in these rooms because the the air is completely dry, uh, because the uh, and you need to keep it dry, you can't walk in as you would be dressed in, let's say, overalls to work in uh, a manufacturing line, you have to wear something like a spacesuit. Why? Because as you breathe, you exhale moisture, and that moisture would then have an impact on the lithium ion batteries. And so you need to be in an outfit that's kind of like a spacesuit. So imagine you're dressed as an astronaut uh, working here. Uh, that has multiple implications. One is that, um, you know, it takes you time to put that outfit on at the beginning of every shift, and it takes you time to take it off at the end of every shift. So the, so the amount of working time is reduced. And the second uh, thing that happens is that you're, uh, um, you're more clumsy uh, because you're dressed up in this suit. And so that further reduces productivity. So anyway, uh, the founder of BYD, uh, couldn't buy the manufacturing line uh, and he came back to China, but he was undeterred. And uh, he came back and he invented the clean box. So this little image that you see on the right-hand side of the screen is, is a clean box. Uh, you see those little rubber things sticking out of the aquarium-like structure. Well, though you put your hand into rubber gloves that are on the inside through those holes and you wear your normal clothes and you manipulate the battery uh, in the manufacturing process as you need it uh, using, using the gloves. So this has several advantages. Um, first of all, there's no, it doesn't cost $10 million. These things cost a few hundred, hundred dollars to make. Uh, secondly, uh, they're modular. So if you're making, hypothetically, uh, 100 batteries an hour, then you know you might need one of these. On the other hand, if you're making 1,000, you need 10 of these. So, so there's it creates flexibility and scalability. And this is something that is super important if you are uh, strapped for capital investment cash, uh, which startups are. Uh, secondly, it increases productivity because there's no prep time. You now don't have to dress up in a space suit to go into this thing, and then you can uh, work a full eight-hour shift. So what was the result of this simple innovation? Well, today BYD uh, you know, makes affordable and low-cost lithium-ion batteries. It controls 25% of the cell phone battery market. So I noticed that there are 74 of you uh, listening to me. So uh, you know, roughly uh, 18 of you would be having a battery in your phone that was made by BYD. And uh, they're the global number three in electric vehicle batteries after Cattle and LG, which are uh, both uh, Korean uh, manufacturers of um, uh, batteries for electric vehicles. Um, and in 2019, Fortune gave them uh, the number three ranking in their uh, publication on Change the World uh, list. So super successful company founded in the 1990s, um, you know, and in a matter of 30 years, they're uh, one of the biggest players in, in the world. Why? because of process innovation. And today, clean rooms are out for lithium ion battery manufacturers. Uh, anybody getting into the game now 
uses uh, the innovation developed by BYD. Now, the third point that I wanted to talk about is uh, focused deployment of limited resources. So if you remember, uh, my opening comment was that a company like Wipro has $8 billion in revenues compared to a roughly $100 billion for IBM, uh, making it 10 times bigger. So if you're Wipro and you want to reach out and you now say that my target audience is the top 1000 company, Fortune 1000 CXOs, then you can start saying, well, where would I find these people to reach them? And the obvious answer is that, well, they are people who fly a lot and so they pass through airports. So then if I look at my major market set as Wipro and I say, well, US is a big market, well, then I have JFK in New York, SFO in San Francisco, and Chicago and Boston as the four major uh, uh, international airports that my uh, target CXOs would be flying out of. And so I buy lit panels, as you can see in the top, uh, top panel, uh, as a way to advertise. Uh, I can do the same for UK and say, you know, Heathrow, Gatwick, Stansted, et cetera, are the top airports. For Japan, it's Narita Airport and the Tokyo subway. So I know the locations where I will get to contact these people, which makes it easy. Uh, you can think a little bit more uh, creatively and they say, well, where do top managers from top companies go? Well, they go to the World Economic Forum. And the World Economic Forum is held in Switzerland, uh, in the winter, and um, there are these buses that ferry people from the conference venue to and from their hotel. And there are just a few, these, there are eight or 10 of these buses that, that do the job. So our friends at Wipro bought advertising on these buses. So through the World Economic Forum every day, as you get into the bus to go to the venue, get out of the bus to uh, enter the venue and on the way back again, there are four opportunities to be exposed to the advertising from, uh, from Wipro. And then you start thinking, well, maybe I should consider uh, this company the next time uh, I need to get some IT services. So you break through the clutter and enter into uh, the mind space. Um, but you know, you also, you need to extend this idea of focus to think about also creating buzz. So is there a way I can be creative? So Mahindra, I'm gonna use an example from Mahindra and Mahindra again. So they, they, one of the geographies that they're present in is in South Africa. So um, Mahindra's advertising in South Africa claimed that they used to make the Willys Jeep for uh, during the Second World War, and they were used actually in the uh, North African theater of war uh, during the Second World War. So Chrysler, which is the owner of the Willys Jeep uh, uh, brand, sued uh, Mahindra and Mahindra. And of course, Mahindra and Mahindra won the case because they actually used to assemble Willys Jeeps uh, back at that time. And, and so uh, they uh, ran this advertising uh, after they, they won. Uh, so the left-hand advertising is the one that got them into trouble. And then the right-hand, um, you know, newspaper looking page that they created was run uh, after they won because uh, they're playing on the fact that they had a victory um, against Chrysler, uh, which, um, and they were comparing it to their, their ability to support the allied forces in North Africa, which in the end led to the victory of um, the allies in, in the Second World War. So uh, by using uh, 
by being creative and thinking out of the box, uh, they're able to get a lot of buzz as uh, this advertising campaign created. The second thing is that, you know, we, we talk a lot about influencers today, and this is the idea of opinion leaders. Um, and and you know, opinion leaders uh, come in various flavors. So you are aware of influencers uh, and, you know, we can talk about some of those things when you sign up and come to my branding class, but um, uh, opinion leaders can also be, for example, academic institutions and, and academics. So Wipro has this uh, CIO series newsletter, which it does in collaboration with uh, uh, the Wharton Business School. Uh, and uh, this is a opt-in uh, newsletter that you can get, which is talking about things that are inform Im important for a chief information officer. And, uh, uh, and so by being associated with Wharton, uh, that creates credibility. Likewise, Wipro did a case study with INSEAD, uh, which also cr creates credibility as um, the case study gets taught not only at INSEAD, but other business schools around the world. So uh, depending on whether you're a B2B or a B2C player, uh, you might want to think about what opinion leaders can you use. And uh, this is an example uh, of how Wipro uh, leveraged its limited budgets through uh, opinion leaders. And, and then, use integrated strategies. So again, let me use Wipro because I think it's a nice uh, kind of a continuous uh, follow through example. Um, so Wipro uh, ran beyond what I've already told you in the bottom panel about the um, panels in the airport and the buses that were wrapped with uh, Wipro advertising. They also took out ads in publications that uh, CXOs in the top Fortune 1000 companies might read. So The Economist, Business Week, New York Times, et cetera. Now, these are very expensive. So um, what did Wipro do to um, be able to uh, use their limited budget in a focused way? So you can buy what are called wraps. So sometimes, I don't know uh, if you have ever had the occasion to receive it, the magazine that or the newspaper that you're buying, it has an outer wrapping and that wrap has on it an advertisement. Uh, these are super expensive, but when you do a wrap, what you can do is to say, I want it to go to the following subscribers. So let's say you have the Economist database and you say, okay, out of your database of N hundred thousand uh, subscribers, um, these 2000 are relevant to me. You pay a lot of money for each of those 2000, but it's still cheaper than buying an ad. So when you have a narrow, segment, you can use mass media where they have subscriptions to be able to selectively target. And then you, you're actually, your cost to reach the person uh, becomes a lot cheaper. So, so they're using a blend of mass media and very targeted media like the bus to create awareness of their brand. Now, They're look headquartered in Bangalore, India. And so when you show some interest in the company or you happen to be coming to meet with people at Infosys or for whatever, um, you use a taxi service of some kind to get you from the uh, airport to your hotel. Now, what Wipro has done is it's found out which are the taxi slash limo services uh, that uh, top managers use when they arrive in Bangalore. And they have um, set up 
a deal with them where when a person of the right profile is ferried by them, they're given this little paper bag that's on the right hand side. And inside this paper bag is a little wooden puzzle box and it asks you to try and open it. And you have at least an hour between the airport and uh, the city, if not longer. So since you've nothing better to do, you're most likely to pull out this puzzle and then uh, try and open the box. And if you succeed in opening the box, which most people will after fiddling with it for uh, some time, uh, you are told that you, you know, to collect your eligible prize, you should go online and, uh, uh, you know, give the code that's there and they will mail to you uh, the, um, the whatever the prize is. Uh, in that process, they're capturing the data on this person so that now this person becomes a member of their database and they can start reaching out to them uh, to make a sale. And then, of course, they have a beautiful campus. So if you ever go to the Wipro campus, or for that matter, the Infosys or DCS campuses, it's really startling because, you know, it's like you're in India till you go through the gates. And when you go through the gates, you've arrived in some first world country. The, it's pristine, it's beautiful, manicured lawns, um, they're vast and you're uh, driven around in a golf cart to whichever building that you're going to, the buildings are impeccably maintained. And as you can see, you look at the um, global command center of Wipro in the bottom, bottom panel, uh, you, this could be anywhere in the world. And so again, <coughs> why are they investing so much money in building these campuses? Because first they've built awareness now that you've shown an interest, they want to impress you. There is a service. And so till you've actually delivered the service, they can't really judge how good you are. But by tangibilizing the offices in, in this way, they're signaling to the buyer that, look, we're like the companies you're used to in the US, like Accenture or IBM, and you can trust us. And so uh, they close the loop uh, by having these world-class physical, physical facilities. So integrated all the way from mass media through, you know, uh, if you will, point of sales uh, items uh, through to um, uh, the uh, delivery sites where they create uh, closure. Now, the last thing I would like to talk about is the idea that you know these are sort of specific examples of uh, innovation and how it's driven through customer centricity, focusing on the product and process, being innovative in terms of integrating your uh, marketing activity. Um, but uh, but I think you know the last example I'm going to use is to essentially say that look. You need a customer-driven business model innovation process that is continuous. And I'm going to use uh, uh, a very interesting example from China, which is uh, Xiaomi. Uh, so this company started uh, out in 2010, and it didn't start out selling and selling anything. It built a operating system that could sit on top of the Android operating system. And uh, they started handing it out to young tech savvy consumers in tier one cities like Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou in 2010. And they, the, the, this operating system was adaptable and uh, they, they interacted with the, uh, these people that they were handing out, it out to to kind of tweak the software. They had uh, weekly software updates. And so they started building this platform and offering through this operating system uh, capabilities 
for any phone that um, ran on Android to be able to provide uh, uh, capabilities that cheaper phones simply didn't have. In 2012, they introduced their first smartphone uh, and they targeted these people who were already uh, engaged with them through the operating system. And obviously uh, the phone took off um, and, uh, you know, as we know, they, they started selling out. They would only sell it online and uh, the phone sold out sometimes in 15, 20 minutes from the time they were launched. Okay, uh, why did they uh, do it this way? Well, it, this kept costs low. And one of their selling propositions was that they offered uh, better technically capable uh, benefit load laden phone, but at a price lower than the competition. So what happened as a result? So you can see all the competitors here in China, whether they are local competitors like Huawei, Oppo, or Vivo, or global competitors like Apple and Samsung. And you see that uh, between 2012 and uh, 2015, uh, our friends at Xiaomi, this orange line uh, that's um, um, ending with the, the Xiaomi logo uh, became the number one uh, selling smartphone in China with a market share of around 15%. That's incredible, right? So interesting new business model, uh, become number one in three, three years. But then of course the world is dynamic. And so um, competition, sees what you're doing and starts catching up. Huawei launches a, um, which is the 800 pound gorilla in China, launches a smartphone that's um, uh, called Honor, which is a sub-brand of Huawei, which is priced cheaper, which offers uh, a similar feature set that Xiaomi does. And what you see is that what by 2016, Huawei has knocked Xiaomi out of the number one position and gained the number one position. Uh, Oppo has done similarly, become number two, and so on and so forth. And our friends at uh, Xiaomi are number four behind, uh, you know, Huawei, Oppo, Vivo, um, and I think uh, God, which one? Apple. Anyway, so the, at this point. Uh, what, uh, Xiaomi needs to do something. And so they um, say, well, what can we do? Well, we have a limited set of customers. We can't really grow that. I mean, that customer segment is saturated. Um, uh, what do we do? So, well, the obvious answer is let's go after non-tech savvy customers and uh, across the city tiers in China. Um, but the big problem there is that, well, uh, these customers are not tech savvy, so they don't want to buy a smartphone online. So for example, somebody like me, I don't want to buy a smartphone online because I want to look at the features and see how it works and ask the salesperson for uh, to demonstrate the features for me, uh, so on and so forth. And so uh, you need retail outlets. Uh, well, that's problematic because um, that's going to not really work because if you're selling two or three smartphones, uh, a retail showroom is just too, too expensive. Um, so, so what do we do? Um, so they decide that, well, okay, you know, the phone is kind of like a remote control and it could potentially be the center of an internet of things uh, ecosystem. And if we had this in, in, uh, ecosystem, then of course we could offer, we could, we could have retail outlets because now we would have a sufficient breadth and products to make it viable to have retail outlets. But wait a minute, we don't make uh, anything other than smartphones. So, they started reaching out to 
business people that were in their network that manufactured consumer durables that would fit in to uh, this idea of internet of things. So for example, maybe the TV, a TV maker, or maybe an air conditioner maker, or a home security system maker. And they started telling these people, which these companies, which were small contract manufacturers for third party players, uh, maybe they were making uh, um, air conditioners for hire, let's say, and they'd go to them and they'd say, okay, we will offer you distribution on our platform if you will manufacture this product for us. And they then got these people to become their suppliers and they started helping these suppliers to reduce their costs by uh, helping them with manufacturing capability, which Xiaomi had developed by then through their phone business, uh, or helping them negotiate with suppliers for better prices on the inputs, because now through the ecosystem, I could buy, I don't know, a certain types of nuts and bolts for 10 different companies. And so now the, the prices become much better. And so they created these win-win partnerships. And importantly, they took a small stake in these companies, a small equity stake, which gave them visibility on their cost structure and so on and so forth. Um, and, and, and the result was that they were quickly able to build a uh, set of products to offer through physical retail outlets, uh, such as this one that you see in the image. And then the question was, where should we put these um, shops. And they decided that, you know, once you move away, you know, the question was, should I put them next to other phone shops or should I put them somewhere else? And they decided that, look, now that they were selling all these different things that would be used in the home, they were more a lifestyle company rather than a phone company or, a, uh, you know, an IT company. And so they uh, started putting these in shopping malls and they said, well, we're like Uniqlo. Uniqlo is also now in India, so you might be familiar with them. And Uniqlo uh, sells less expensive fast fashion, okay? And they're a lifestyle brand. And so they, by putting themselves next to Uniqlo stores, they were able to get a rub off because people started seeing Xiaomi more as a lifestyle brand. And so they, as, you, as they say, the rest is, the rest is history. Um, in 2021, they became the number one smartphone brand globally. And they, are today the world's largest internet of things player. It's a company that was founded in 2010. By 2021, they had already become the world's largest IoT player and the world's largest smartphone player. Um, their revenues in 2021 ended at almost 51 billion US dollars. Uh, think about that for a second from zero to 51 billion in one decade. Uh, so, and, and, and the driving force behind it are twofold. My first point is, was that they were, that you have to be focused on customers. And my second point was that you have to have product and process innovation. And um, you see that this is something that Xiaomi has uh, played to the hilt. And obviously the data that they're generating from their internet business is then being fed into deciding on what new products they might want, um, where they should uh, locate their stores, what should be the product mix in those locations and so on and so forth to create uh, this uh, incredibly successful business. 
Uh, let me close by making one final point about Xiaomi. So, you know, in, Michael Porter, way back in 1980, came up with this idea of, uh, uh, you know, that there were two basic strategies that you can have. Uh, you can either have a low cost strategy. So the column on the left, uh, you know, under advantage, is the low cost strategy. And then you have another one, which is the product service uniqueness strategy, which is the differentiation strategy. And what he said was that these are mutually exclusive strategies. You cannot have a low cost, unique, so unique product strategy and I would argue to, with you that that is exactly what Xiaomi has achieved because it offers a differentiated product portfolio and it does so at a low cost. And so this is a strategic posture that is a new strategic posture. And uh, this has been driven by kind of managing both customer and supplier intimacy. So historically companies have been may be customer uh, intimate, but they certainly haven't been supplier intimate. And by very carefully selecting the customers, uh, supplier, sorry, and selecting uh, and taking an equity stake there and helping them improve themselves, um, what Xiaomi has achieved is intimacy on the supplier side as well. And this combination of supplier and customer intimacy uh, has allowed them to create this low cost and differentiated model. And, uh, you know, uh, my uh, former PhD student and I uh, call this the strategic coalescence uh, strategy. And, um, uh, you know, we have a Harvard Business Review article that came out last year uh, speaking, uh, speaking to, to this strategy in more detail. So, uh, let me stop there to summarize narrow customer segments, customer-centric product innovation, frugal process innovation, focus deployment of your limited resources, and um, continuous um, innovation of the business model. Uh, I'd be happy to take any, any questions at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ramatawa. Uh, everyone who's here, uh... We are open for questions right now. You can see a little Q and A tab uh, at the bottom of your screen. You can leave your the questions there, and we'll do our best to answer all of them. So, uh, Amit Bajaj, you asked, uh, "What's the most effective way to uh, connect with a target customer digitally?" Um, I don't think that you know one could say that, oh, it's always SMS, always email, always WhatsApp, you, you really need to understand the customer. So for example, I know lots of people who are happy to receive messages by SMS. Personally, I don't even look at my SMS. I uh, uh, go there maybe once every week or so to see if there's something important that I, that I need to deal with. But you know, if you were to reach out to me on uh, uh, email, uh, you, you're much more likely to get, to get a response. Uh, and so I think that different market segments have different preferences for how they would like to be reached and how they would like to be reached depending on the situation. Uh, and I think that if you really want to succeed, you need to understand how your target segment would like you to reach them. And there is no one unique un magic bullet, I'm afraid. All right. Um, is digital marketing a solution to find right customers? Well, it depends on your customer again, right? Because for example, if, you, if you're targeting relatively less affluent people in India, probably digital marketing makes no sense at all because they don't have um, 
access to the uh, to the internet. At best, they have access to WhatsApp, and uh, maybe they can't really, since you can't really transact uh, using uh, WhatsApp very well. Maybe digital marketing doesn't work at all. So you really have to start thinking. Um, and it's not just about being poor. Uh, maybe I, I feel a little suspicious when I get uh, a message uh, on my uh, WhatsApp or uh, whatever. Uh, what kind of a company are you? And so, so you really have to, again, think, what does my target consumer really want? And I think that we... Uh, we put the cart before the horse when we start asking questions like, uh, well, uh, is X better than Y? Uh, it, it, the answer is it depends on your customer. So really you need to be able to number one say, who are my customers? So I said, Wipro said that it was the top 1000 CXOs. Mahindra and Mahindra said it is people who want a sports utility vehicle or a utility vehicle. And then within that, they broke it out into sports utility and utility. And then you look and say, okay, uh, how do I, you know, how do these people wish to be targeted? Uh, what's the message that they want and so on and so forth. And so you really have to take the trouble of understanding your customer, okay? Um, Mahip Gupta, well, Thank you. I'm really happy that you enjoyed the session, Mahib. Uh, uh, jewelry business where everything is outsourced and gold prices are rising. Uh, low cost players are coming in. How does one compete? Um, so first of all, I think that, you know, there's the demand side and there's the cost side. So uh, if you build a brand, so for example, you can go to Louis Vuitton and you can pay $3,000 for a plastic handbag. And if you go to France and you go to uh, their flagship store on the Champs-Élysées, there are these young women from countries like China who are hanging around outside and they'll come up to you and they'll ask you, can you please go in there and buy this bag for me? Uh, and you know, it happened. To, my wife and I were happened to be walking down the Champs Elysees some years ago, and um, this happened to us. And and so I asked them, why do you want me to go in and buy? And uh, so they said, well, they're only going to sell us three bags, and they take down our passport number, and then for the next three days they will not sell us anything more. So I can charge you $3,000 for a plastic bag. And then I can tell you that don't come back for three more days because I, I won't sell you anymore. Why? Because it's a Louis Vuitton bag. You know, uh, you can buy a watch today for a few hundred rupees, right? I mean, one of these digital watches. Or you can go and buy a Rolex for a few lakhs. They both tell time equally. Well, actually, the Rolex probably doesn't tell time, particularly if it's a mechanical Rolex. It won't tell time as well as the cheap watch. So I think that you have to build this brand, and you build the brand by telling the story of the craftsmanship behind it, uh, how uh, maybe tell the story of the process, maybe open that out to the customer in some ways. I mean, this is um, this can become a long question, a long answer to your question. So I'll stop here. But I think that the key to competing with low cost is to build a branded business where people are attracted to your business because you're offering them unique designs you're off and uh, you're offering them uh, you know uh, quality workmanship uh, people pay for that and 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 you have to think uh, what is it that people will want me to pay for 
want to pay me for and then uh, build your strategy around that. Um, Anunia Jose, um, what percentage can we set for annual marketing budgets? So I think that that's looking at the question a little from little backwards again, if, with all due respect. So, you know, this is the most popular way in which marketing budgets get set. And, you know, you basically look and say, well, last year we spent X percent of our budget in marketing, we'll spend X percent again this year, or in my industry, it is X percent, and so I'll set, set X percent. But I think that's precisely the wrong way of doing it. Because what you need to do is you need to do zero-based budgeting. You need to start out by saying, what is it that I want to achieve this year? And to achieve that, if I want to, let's say, increase my market share by 2% or 5%, whatever, pick a number, then to do that, what are the things that I have to do? What do I have to do, for example, on the channel strategy side? What do I have to do on the product strategy side? What do I have to do on the communication side? And then what would each of those initiatives cost and build the budget backwards from that? So uh, then you have a realistic budget. Otherwise by saying, oh, it's 5%, 15%, choose your number. Uh, I think it's uh, completely uh, meaningless. So uh, zero-based budgeting is where, where you need to go. Um, I'm not sure, Abhinav, what you mean by is this strategy affected by corona situation? Um, what strategy and uh, like companies that have been in certain spaces have benefited from the coronavirus, others have suffered. So I really can't answer your question unless it, it's a much more specific and contextualized question. Um, uh, Ravindra Patil, uh, platforms for mobile company initially was techies and then they introduced and scaled up. What are the examples? What are such examples in India? Um, I'm not familiar with a company that has been as successful as Xiaomi in terms of morphing from um, digital to physical uh, in, in India. So I'm uh, going to have to plead ignorance and maybe uh, one of my hero Viad colleagues can contextualize it uh, to India uh, if such an example uh, exists. So um, I'll have to skip that one. Tathagato Basu, what are the various uh, data points, resources a startup should look into when it wants to penetrate the market? For example, if it is a cloud kitchen, is there any specific that needs to be answered before plunging into the market? Um, I mean, I think that before plunging into any market, no matter whether you're uh, a startup or an established company expanding into a new market, you really need to be able to uh, answer the question as to who are these customers and what do they want. Um, and once you know who these customers are and what do they want, then I think you can... Um, decide whether you have the capacity to be able to successfully compete uh, and win in that marketplace. So uh, it again comes back to beginning with a, a greater specificity on who is my customer. And then I think we should be able to move to a world where one can answer the question, uh, uh, you know, what should I do? And, uh, you know, if you do decide to take the program, I mean, the, the, first, the first session that INSEAD will do in that uh, program will be a session on how do we become customer-centric and 
uh, how, do, how do the principles of design thinking help us to become uh, customer centric? So, uh, and then later on, uh, we have sessions on innovation and branding, which will tell you how to win. So if I go back to the idea that Porter, Michael Porter floated about 20 years ago, that strategy is really answering two questions. Uh, who are my customers and how do I win? Uh, we're going to uh, focus on both those questions uh, in the context of the NCAD sessions uh, uh, that this program will have. Ah, everybody follows the same route, mostly for advertisement. So Krishna, uh, that's a excellent question. So that's an excellent, um, uh, excellent question. Um, so first of all, I think that competition, competing uh, for the consumer's heart and mind, advertising is one part. It's really, you have to think about it as the whole business, okay? Um, so, you know, I've heard a lot about Indigo and I took an Indigo flight uh, 10 days ago and I was very, very unhappy. So first of all, um, when I booked the ticket, I found the interface very confusing. Uh, I had to go back and forth two or three times to figure out exactly what I wanted because, for example, if you want to choose uh, your seat and you want to choose a non-standard seat, then it's not that you pay more for a non-standard seat, but you have to also first pay more for the ticket itself. And you can't choose the standard ticket and get one of the non-standard seats. That's nowhere clear. And I don't understand why it should be done that way instead of simply saying that certain seats cost more. And then instead of charging me 500 for the non-standard seat, maybe charge me a thousand rupees for the non-standard seat and, and, and let me, uh, so, so anyway, let me not get irate about my whole Indigo experience, but bottom line, I think for me, it wasn't that I hadn't heard good things about them, but it was a complete service failure from the moment I tried to book with them through my onboard experience. Uh, so uh, terrible. Uh, so I think that you have to think of the whole business. You have to think about all the ways in which the customer is touched by the company. And then you have to worry about each touch point to, um, to be able to get the customers uh, to, to love you. And I think uh, that's, that's how you truly differentiate your, your business. It's not about advertising. It's about how your business relates to the customer and meets that customer's needs. Okay. Um, I hope that answers your question. How do companies measure, how do companies and investors measure success in emerging markets? Um, Parabint, I think that's for the company to decide, right? I mean, success for a, success depends on what goal you set up in the first place. So if your goal is simply to, so for example, many, many years ago, uh, for example, uh, Bajaj, auto started selling two wheelers in Europe. Um, but they, they sold maybe a few thousand two wheelers in, in Europe, but they were very happy with that. Why? Because their goal was to be able to say, say that they're the only Indian two wheeler maker selling in Europe. So was, were they successful in Europe by that metric? Yes, of course they were successful. So why are you doing that piece of business? Sometimes you do it simply because it is a signal for something else. Uh, on the other hand, maybe sometimes you do the business because that's what's going to drive your future. So you really, there isn't an answer which says, how do I decide, how do companies do it at, in, at large? It really depends on 
what's your goal and did you meet that goal? So uh, if you were to think about your own business, then say, what is my goal for the next year? And what is my goal in the next three years and in the next five years? And then say, at the end of the first year, did you meet those goals? If you did, you succeeded. If you didn't, you failed. So I have a very simplistic view of looking at it, but I don't think that the question can be uh, answered in the abstract. Uh, I hope uh, that's, uh, that answers your question. Um, let's see, Ravindra Patil, how ethics are playing role, need to know the customer. Uh, so that's a great question, Ravindra, between um, ethics and uh, uh, you know, using customer data. So I think that transparency is super important. I think customers are customers are protective of their data because I think companies are ripping them off. Uh, I can't pr protect myself from companies taking away my data. I mean, Google is probably one of the biggest uh, offenders in, in 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 this space because, uh, first of all. Uh, if I want to use Google Maps, I'm happy to pay for it, but they won't actually let me pay for it. So the option, the option of using the service and paying for it and saying, I don't want you to use my data doesn't exist, okay? Which I think is kind of strange. Secondly, uh, if you go into their, uh, if you go in and you start saying, okay, how do I protect my privacy? The way they word their, uh, uh, you know, privacy, you know, filters. I personally find it very difficult to decide whether yes is the right answer or no is the right answer, and I'd argue that I'm a reasonably smart person, and maybe that's a problem. Then that if a reasonably smart person can't exactly figure out confidently what the answer, right answer should be to a simple question about whether my data should be used by Google or not. So when you live in a world like that, people stop trusting you. But if you were to be transparent, that's a whole different uh, world. And I think people will start tr trusting you. And and then they'll say, well, am I getting what's fair in exchange for what I'm giving you? So there's a, comp a startup called CX Sphere out of Toronto, which is uh, started by uh, uh, two former students of mine. Uh, they're both Indian as it turns out, but the startup is based in, in Toronto uh, and, and I've been advising them. Uh, and, and they're building an AI based uh, suite of marketing services where uh, it will be strictly on the basis of permission-based marketing. And so uh, they will approach people to get onto their database. They will be asked if they're willing to uh, share their data. And indeed, they'll be offered money to share their data. So if you think that it's worthwhile to uh, share a particular piece of data to a particular kind of uh, company, uh, then, then, then you'll get paid for it. And I think that a uh, a transparent platform like that uh, might potentially upend uh, a lot of the big companies that are out there today. So uh, I would say deal fairly with your customers, be transparent, and they will share their data with you. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Oh, uh, uh, okay. Ankur, you said higher budget branding strategies. Uh, how do you compete when you don't have the budget? Uh, well, I think you compete when you don't have the budget by uh, doing things that don't cost a lot of money. So first of all, I think uh, the number one thing I would say is be clear on who your customers are. Be narrow in your definition of customers. Once you have a narrow definition of customers, then you can start thinking about how do I reach reach them, right? So so so, be cus be clear about what 
which customers you're targeting and what exactly you want to say to them. And then I think that there are many ways that you can think of that would be creative ways to, to target. So for example, um, I, I am good friends with a this found, with one of the founders of a startup in India called Mrida. And Mrida is a social enterprise that uh, buys uh, uh, agricultural products, uh, food, food related agricultural products at a premium price from marginal farmers. And it then sells uh, this to the uh, so called Lohas segment, the lifestyles and healthy, uh, health uh, oriented segment in uh, urban India. Uh, and uh, the, they do all kinds of interesting things. So for example, they uh, hold, uh, you know, they talk about their company in uh, large uh, corporate offices and they set up a little booth and they sell through that uh, on a sort of event basis. Uh, they, um, uh, they, they have uh, collaborated because they're in the food space. They've collaborated with culinary institutes um, to hold um, uh, competitions uh, for dishes made by their products. Uh, and, and they've been uh, quite successful in uh, building this brand called Earthspired that you might want to look up. It's today distributed, for example, through Amazon India, among other, other places. So I think the key is to say, who is my customer segment uh, and what's my value proposition? And then, and then really look for partners who might be quite happy to collaborate with you. And so, for example, I can't remember the chef's name, but he's a well-known um, celebrity chef in India, and he's the judge for uh, the cooking, uh, the recipe contest. And the way they were able to get him is because, you know, they're a social enterprise and the chef feels good about um, uh, having his name associated with uh, uh, with this uh, with this business they're also working through nutritionists who need to find food items to recommend to people coming to them with nutritional problems and and so uh, they found their own way of getting through small budget so know your customer and then look to see what are non-traditional ways of reaching out to them uh, and you'll be able to manage it on a limited budget um, Dipyendu Sarkar um, does the foreign investor looking for higher CAGR of revenue, profit margin, or future of the particular industry. Um, Dipyendu, I'm not following your question. Is your question when will a foreign investor invest in your business? Uh, if I can contextualize it, I, I believe the Vendu is asking when a foreign investor looks at investing in a business, do they look at uh, the revenue and profit margins of the company first, or do they look at uh, the business model and you know how its future looks like, at least according to them? Well, I think they would look at both, right? Because they would look at what. I mean, if they invest, they're investing because there's a future. And so that's going to be a big priority. I mean, time, uh, your current uh, revenues and margins uh, give a proof of concept. So if, uh, if you come to me and say that, look, I have this uh, uh, incredible idea, I'd like to see some execution. And that execution is, is, is going to show me uh, the uh, margin and the growth uh, elements. And then I would look to see whether uh, this is going to have a future because do you have something that's actually ring fenced uh, because it's highly differentiated and your differentiator can't be copied very easily? Or is this something that, uh, you know, uh, anybody can uh, come and knock off 
And so the bigger competitors in the space can simply uh, step into it. So I think uh, it's not a one or the other question. I think they would look at all of it uh, to be able to in their due diligence process. We would like to thank you for your time. I mean, it was an extremely insightful session for all of us. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I would also like to uh, invite Shiva from our, uh, our faculty cohort at Hero Wired uh, to talk a little bit about our strategic management and business essentials program. Uh, the program that uh, Professor Matawa was referring to earlier, which we've developed uh, together. Over to you, Shiva. Uh, thanks, thanks, Sharan. So, firstly, that was uh, those were some incredible stories from emerging markets uh, and how emerging market companies uh, innovate. Uh, there are two reasons to, to uh, I find them incredible and exciting. The first is that a lot of us in the audience, myself included, are in the process of building businesses in various different capacities in India. And you see and hear about innovation. You see and hear about the capability of Indian uh, Indians to innovate. You see DRDO come up with you know pretty impressive weaponry. You, you hear about Covaxin uh, being developed in India, but to actually have a rigorous academic study that tells you that emerging market companies can innovate as well, uh, if not better than their Western peers uh, is both exciting and reassuring. Um, in terms of in terms of building businesses itself, it uh, it gives us not only the confidence to to power ahead and focus on innovation. It also challenges us to think uh, to to actually reevaluate in terms of how we see ourselves as businesses. In a lot of situations building businesses in India, you make assumptions, you make assumptions about a particular piece of technology that you you assume that you'll have to buy off the shelf, but for all you know, a, sort of a cheaper and a more effective solution might be available if you if you just stop to ask yourself if there's uh, innovation that can, that can uh, be done internally to do the same job for you. And the second reason, uh, the, the, the second point of interest there was also in terms of how we teach at Hero Wired. As you all know, we are a learn, learning technology company. As And as you all know, one of the very exciting things that we're looking forward to is the uh, certificate program that we are going to be offering uh, in collaboration with, uh, with INSEAD, with uh, some very distinguished professors like Professor Chattopadhyay also teaching uh, the cohort. Um, and the way the the program has been uh, put together so far is that in addition to uh, in addition to subjects one might come to expect in a in a program on business management such as finance operations and so on uh, thanks to uh, thanks to some very valuable inputs from the NCR team uh, and professor chatopadhyay what we have is uh, uh, the, the, the focus on strategy and innovation and areas like design thinking, which uh, I'm increasingly convinced now are going to be uh, factors that de determine success. Um, the, the the emphasis on these areas in the certificate in in the program that we're going to be offering is very significant. And as I get more and more involved, as we speak more and more to uh, uh, as we, we speak more and more to the industry, as we speak more and more to uh, the team at INSEAD, uh, we are that much more convinced that um, our whole uh, approach to, uh, you know, our, our whole approach to focusing on on, uh, on on innovation, design thinking, and so on, uh, it's going to be it's going to prove to be a very valuable offering for students. The one last thing that I would like to say in the context of uh, in the context of the program that we are offering is one of the one of the uh, one of the things that we constantly remind ourselves as we as uh, that we constantly reminded ourselves when we put this program together was the word applied. 
when when you sit through a course when you sit through a class um the a bit unlike uh, what a traditional uh, program and management might uh, teach you uh, our emphasis was uh, our emphasis has been uh, to make uh, what you learn uh, direct as as to the extent possible as directly applicable uh, as possible in your workplace situations uh, for you to just be an effect, a more effective manager and for you to be able to more effectively build businesses so those are some of the thoughts that 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 come to mind uh, as as uh, i speak to you now um and i i share uh, professor chatopadhyay's hope that we will see some of you uh, in the in the course which which kicks off uh, a few weeks from now um for more information uh, for more information responding to god of aurora and uh, anyone else who might have the have this question uh, i would ask you to please reach out to uh, hero wide for a fairly detailed uh, conversation on uh, which we should take into account your circumstances your background to tell you uh, to, to 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 examine to explore to answer the question of whether the course is, is for you but i will leave you with a thought that it is a thought a course that has been put together with a lot of thought uh, and it's also uh it's also a matter of uh, great confidence and excitement and pride that we're offering this in association with uh with uh, such an established institution such as ncert uh on that note uh, thank you all very much uh, and last but not the least uh thanks a ton to professor professor chatopadhyay for taking the time out for that incredibly uh insightful session on uh innovation and emerging market businesses uh, thank you all